So, I'm back. I'm taking a short break from videos and YouTubing due to uh, taking a new job, taking a two and a half thousand mile train trip around Europe. You can check out the description to learn more. And schools being delayed, interrupted, and potentially being put on hold to the coronavirus. I'm now feeling refreshed, ready, full of burning rage to discuss an outdated theory of political thought that draws from damaging religious ideas to dictate and control political decision making both throughout the 19th and 20th century and into the present day politics and history go hand in hand with many politicians either having studied it as a degree subject or managing to find the time to order interns to research ghostwrite and edit works of historical analysis Winston Churchill Garbage Man won the Nobel Prize for his works of history, and there are several members of the current cabinet as of 2020 who have produced works that involve some history, a few bits, a layer of history that sort of covers their own agenda. But there is a worrying amount of people in the current cabinet, current for now, who are proud proponents of Whig history, and it's worrying because, well, Whig history is old-fashioned, colonialist, and a bit shit, and explains a lot of political short-sightedness. So let's get right into it. What is Whig history? Whig history is a school of thought that sees history as a straight, sort of linear line from bad times to the good civilised time. Civilization is on a constant improvement plan towards an eventual end goal where we'll live in a joyous paradise of science, individual liberty, liberal western style democracy and constitutional monarchy. The improvements are made by great figures who are you know, they're not influenced by society and culture as they're helping mankind to progress with many Whig historians seeing their vision and insight to progress being provided by a plan created by God. This type of analysis, looking back to the past and creating a simple straight line of progression, is called teleology. Essentially, you're telling the story of what happened based on what you know of what actually happened. It's easy to write a book saying that, for example, Britain was destined to rule the largest empire in the world when you're living at the apex and you know how it happened and you can skip over all the boring bits or confusing bits that get in the way of telling the good story. The definitive text that came to define exactly what a Whig historian was and how they saw the world is the History of England, written by Thomas Babington Macaulay and published in 1848. He wrote of the linear growth of Britain as a morally superior nation that should come to dominate the world as the natural descendants of the Romans. Just like the Romans, Macaulay and others of his station saw Britons as a proud, noble, empire-building, higher plane of human existence than the rest of the world, and ready to implement an ideal societal structure to the uncivilised masses of Africa and Asia. The world for those like Macaulay, was split between the civilised progressiveness of nations like Britain, but most of all Britain, who are always developing and moving on, and the backwards barbarism of everywhere else. But luckily, they too can move forwards and always be on the path towards their eventual divinely decided endpoint, provided they be just like Britain. The Butterfield Characteristics of Whig History so, there are a lot of problems with interpreting history through the Whig lens, but let's first discuss what might be considered the essential characteristics of Whig history. The term was coined, defined and ruthlessly skewered in 1931's The Whig Interpretation of History. Written by Herbert Butterfield, a Regis Professor of History at Cambridge, the work was almost a reflexive response to the continuing prevalence of what he would call Whig history. After all, if God had this plan for society to get better and society was supposed to be constantly progressing forwards, why wasn't it? Things weren't getting better. The morally superior British Empire was stagnating and nations were rightly calling for independence. Millions and millions of men had died in a war to save empires 
only for those empires and nations who had existed for hundreds if not thousands of years to be swept away as if they'd never been there before. The economy tanked, there was a worldwide economic depression and the British pound was in absolute crisis, it was in freefall. If there was this divine plan of progression by God, why were things going so badly? While Butterfield's definition should not be considered definitive, he came up with a flexible checklist for working out whether or not a historical work is Whiggish. Play along at home, history fans! The work looks to the past and analyses trends by referencing present trends and events, sort of like talking about the bourgeoisie and the proletariat in the 14th century. It assumes that Britain was always going to end up with a constitutional monarchy and describes a British-style political system as the absolute pinnacle of human development. Everyone in the past saw constitutional monarchy as the ideal they wanted and should strive for, no matter what the evidence shows. Notable figures in the past believed the same political views that a person in the modern era would have. Everyone in the past is either a hero or a villain, heroes who progress society and evil bad people who hinder progress and keep society backwards. Butterfield's characteristics are not the be-all and end-all of what is and isn't Whig history, but they're a very good place to start. Most of all, he calls attention to the attitudes of certain historians to centre the present in how they look at the past, or as Butterfield called it, searching for the unlikenesses between the past and present. His work has not been without criticism over the years. Rupert Hall's On Whiggism calls his work an incoherent, blunt and clumsy weapon for looking at historiographical trends, and that's a burn, and G.R. Elton dismisses it as lacking in substance, which he would do with all his insistence on modern-style bureaucratic government in the 16th century. Essentially, Butterfield's characteristics can be taken as a broad groundwork for what academic history shouldn't be, not what it could be, and it's a reminder to avoid laziness. It's tempting at three in the morning when you're working to a vastly approaching deadline to just conclude, oh, the Reformation happened because the Reformation happened. I read your work, G.W. Bernard, and I can see into your heart. But it's not intellectually satisfying or even really worth anyone's time, not even your own. Why is Whiggishness the bad thing? The first criticism of Whiggish historiography would be that the phrase is fairly loaded and carries a particular taint of colonialism that it can never be separated from, even though there are some modern historians trying to bring it back, back, back. Whig history is linked with ideas of British superiority and inferiority of non-British, non-white races. Whig history sees that the British societal structure is morally superior, brought into being by a Abrahamic Christian god, both ignoring the value of culture and societies of the people forcibly brought into the empire and claiming the ideas of other cultures and nations that have been integrated into our everyday lives as being uniquely and solely British. You know, things like Arabic numbers, Roman naming conventions, Islamic medicine. Whig history is linked to these racist narratives of European superiority. So no matter how you try and reclaim Whiggishness, it's, it's always got that around it. A major academic problem with looking at the past through the Whig lens is that, well, hindsight's a hell of a drug. Those who are looking in the past with the mindset of proving where things definitely come from or that they were always going to happen will find what they want to look for but not what's actually there. Looking back over time for that clear linear progression of an aspect of society such as the development of medicine or parliamentary style democracy you can absolutely find that straight line but you'll be skipping over the context of thought, the beliefs of people living then and all the wriggly complicated confusing bits that happened. History isn't a straight line from point A to point B. It's wriggly, it's meandering, there are setbacks and things that progress while others regress and to ignore all those areas that don't involve winners or improvements is to gloss over important aspects of historical societies and events and to cause huge mischaracterizations of people, events and cultural thought. If you look at the life of Henry VIII, 
knowing what he is eventually going to do, you'll find evidence that he was a psychopath and a tyrant and he had a weird thing with women. But you can come up with that conclusion because you already know what he's going to do. So is that valid as a theory or an interpretation of events? Events can only appear linear once they've already happened. And it's easy to think that a material force such as a divine being controls society when you know what worked and what hasn't. Creating great man narratives doesn't present a holistic or even a useful way to look at historical events. Focusing only on Edward VI's drive to reform the English church and assigning figures who supported him or opposed him as being good or bad is a really narrow way to look at that aspect of the English Reformation, ignoring the wider context of religion within England over the 15th and 16th century, the role of rising to find Protestantism and the different sects within that, Edward's tutorage, attitudes towards Catholicism within England and within Europe, the creation of a distinct English national identity over the 16th century, the role of contemporary printing, rediscovery of classical authors, there's a lot more to the English Reformation than Hornbag King wants new marriage, Pope bad, Thomas More good. The way of looking at history overlaps with Christian narratives, particularly Anglican ones. Whig history celebrates the triumph of good old-fashioned British reason over misinformation and superstition, particularly that European nonsense Catholicism, we need our own British church. Euroscepticism goes hand in hand with Whig history and believing that a capitalist laissez-faire free market is the ultimate creation of human life, which is a thing you can argue, I guess. That's why you have a, a theorist in full Whig mode, one Francis Fukima, declaring that the fall of the Berlin Wall is the end of history. After all, the world had reached its predetestined capitalist free-thinking fulfilment and nothing would change and humanity would stay at a pure zenith of enlightenment for the rest of time. I'm a clown. None of this is to say that there's no value in wig works of history or that you should ignore them if you're looking at the historiography of a personal topic, but you need to question the usefulness of examining history by ignoring everything along the way that fails, goes nowhere, or doesn't fit British superiority divinely mandated views. And how biased a source their works might be as Wiki historians, as they are always looking to promote Christianity, monarchy, and parliamentary narratives. What impact does it play on society? So Wiki history is incredibly old fashioned at this point, but that lifeless corpse of Whiggism does get routinely resurrected. This glory fueled triumphant, elitist version of history, which centres Britain and British institutions as being inherently superior, appeals and satisfies the needs of certain traditionalist and right-leaning politicians, and is often the behind-the-scenes ideology of their policies. Particularly in Britain, there's this need for our history to cement a sense of pride, superiority, lifelong patriotism, looking back at the progress of history to our current now, looking at kings, queens, the battles they fought, the occasional quirk where things didn't go entirely to plan and it's all about you should just not question Parliament and the Queen. They're so great. They're so amazing. Isn't it wonderful we have a Queen? And let's not look at the history of groups such as the poor, women, immigrants, social movements of British society and politics over time. Nowhere can this be seen more clearly than in the Coalition's changes to the history curriculum undertaken by proud Whig, apparently Education Secretary Michael Gove. say his name and education in the same sentence teachers across Britain get irrationally angry and suffer spontaneous pay freezes. Anyway, 
He radically altered the teaching of history across primary and secondary schools in the UK. History, he decided, with all his knowledge of education from... Oh yeah, he doesn't have any knowledge of education. He decided history would be taught sequentially as a narrative of British progress, with EYFS students starting with the Stone Age, that's early years foundation stage for non-schooly people, so reception year one, moving through British history at a rapid pace until year nine students cover the 19th and early 20th century before covering longer term studies in key stage four and A level. Oh, I see how you set the curriculum to avoid any discussion of politics in the 20th century and the actions of the Conservative government in the 70s and 80s. You don't fool me for a minute, Mr Gove. While primary school teachers were annoyed that they get to miss out on covering the Tudors and the Victorians, which are always surefire crowd pleasers, it also meant that history curriculums were not allowed to cover events that were not deemed to focus enough on British history. So Egyptians, Greeks, out the door, but also figures and aspects of the British Empire that were not considered British enough. There are many people and communities in modern Britain that live here because of the empire, myself included, my father's family being South African, whose history and contributions to our modern society well, they're just not British enough, even though we were colonised by them. And sure, a story with a beginning, middle and end makes for a simplified narrative that we can all follow. So we can start off the, the Stone Age, go through the development of Britain, and then we stop, you know, around the World Wars so we don't have to cover losing the empire. But the ideology that's brought this style of looking at history education is designed to shape how people see themselves their relationship to national identity, and whether or not they are British enough. The simplified narrative with good heroes and bad villains promotes this nationalistic, pro-monarchy, pro-landed class agenda which is deeply infused with Christian presumptions about Britain's place in the world. There's a reason why British mainstream history schooling discusses how we won World War II and we stopped the transatlantic slave trade, while not necessarily covering how that transatlantic slave trade started or anything on the history of Ireland unless you take it as a special elective. The lives of black and Indian Britons under empire and the paths they took to independence are brushed away, covered with such breathtaking speed as to rob talking about it of all meaning. This is most exemplified by the outcry that followed the mooted idea of removing Mary Seacole from coverage in schools. One of the very few black Britons considered worthy of any coverage at all, she was a Caribbean nurse who worked in the Crimean War at the same time as Florence Nightingale. The same time, but not in the same places, as the British Army rejected her help and she was forced to travel there independently to set up well, she called it a hotel, so she ran it for profit, but it provided food and medical care to soldiers. Her training in folk medicine, health care and simple standardised hygiene was seen as the true basis for the reforms to nursing made by Florence Nightingale. After all, Mary Seacole had been raised by a family of nurses and professional caregivers, while Nightingale didn't have the same background of personal experience. And while Florence Nightingale is a remarkable woman, and she did do good things and made radical changes and improved society for the better, she still dismissed Seacole as a liar and a drunk, which helped contribute to how Seacole died alone, impoverished and maligned by a racist state, and is still subject to those same forces who feel the need to dip into casual racism to stand for Florence Nightingale, a woman dead for over a hundred years. And Seacole doesn't fit the narrative of British Whiggish progressiveness. Her story is a failure. She doesn't bring a net worth to the British state. Not like that story of a brave woman working alone with her little lamp of scientific reason and Christian good. Whiggish interpretations look to tradition, but also to the potential future. That somewhere in the distance, God and Britishness will bring us to. It's a living legacy of the Victorians. An outdated theory that combines nationalism and theology to empower those already in power and to sideline the lesser go-nowhere histories, experiences of the poor, the uncivilised and anyone who's not white, male and worth at least 30k a year. Aside from that, it's also just pretty silly from an intellectual standpoint. 
you can't gain any understanding of why things happened by only looking at that very narrow selection of what happened and what people thought that only seeks to confirm what you already believe. It is impossible to work without a bias in history. I mean, I have my own biases when I look at a topic, it's quite clear. But it is absolutely folly to try and paint a straight line from the Roman Republic to the parliamentary democracy that we have in the UK in the 21st century. Just ain't happening, love. The Romans didn't value or even have a concept of parliamentary democracy. And sure, they did see themselves as the intellectual superiors of the world, but they couldn't even figure out a form of stable government that didn't see emperors stabbed into bloody bits in the forum while one guy with the most money buys emperorship. So maybe let's not be exactly like them. Let's close with a quote from Herbert Butterfield himself. It is never safe to forget the truth which really underlines historical research. The truth that all history perpetually requires to be corrected by more history. Thanks for listening. I'm sorry for my monthly break. Um, I just I didn't have the time. I've started a, a new job uh, working through teaching school. So doing the more admin side, which is very exciting. Um, I did a two and a half thousand mile uh, green conscious train trip across Europe. And I put a link to the article where I describe it, sort of my experiences as a disabled and eco-conscious traveller. Um, all my sources used for just talking about Whig history, doing a bit more research, are listed below. Uh, if you like my ranting about Michael Gove, because he is a terrible, just really bad... Um, if you liked it anyway, uh, donate to my uh, to my coffee down below. You can buy me resources for future videos uh, via my sort of gift was it gift list wish list on Amazon. And what else? Oh, and I should be working. I'm working over the course of this year of sort of a historical breakdown slash generalized screaming review of Stephen Moffat and Mark Gattis's. 2020 Dracula, sort of examining the historical idea of the vampire myth in society, what it means in literature, and why that show was just just real bad. Real, real bad. But anyway, uh, donate, buy me books, give me a like and a follow. Thank you, I shall see you in soon. Whenever's convenient, it's your choice. Call now.